All right then, it's 90 something degrees today in Kansas City. It's hotter than heck out here. I want to get this done and out of my way. I have two minis behind me here. One's a John Cooper Works Clubman. The other one is a Cooper S. What do these two have in common? They are both N14 motors. That is correct. This is a 2008 Mini Cooper S with the John Cooper Works tuning kit. And this is a 2009 John Cooper Works Clubman. And in this video today, I'm gonna to show you what to look for when buying an N14 motored Mini Cooper so that when you go out there to buy one, you're not scared of the engine and all of its craziness and idiosyncrasies and quirkiness and the things that scare people away from these motors usually because quite frankly if you know what to look for and you're handy enough and you know everything about this motor you're not going to be afraid of it and you're actually going to enjoy these cars immensely so to start with this is my 2008 mini cooper s with the john cooper works tuning kit now, naturally, as all of you are aware, this car has had extensive rebuilding and modification and upgrading, and all that has gone to make this a very nice little vehicle. Now, the reason why all this was done, I bought the car with a broken third piston and a, and a cylinder head that needed to be machined. So, sounds like a horror story but it was not the timing chain in this one now everyone knows the stories about the timing chains that thing that's under here everyone knows that oh they stretch and all that wonderful good stuff here's the thing they stretch and they wear out because the oil goes goes low on these also recently i had a throttle body failure so i had to replace that not a difficult thing it's mounted underneath the air box three bolts comes right out so that was another thing. This is actually not a difficult engine to work on, especially if you want to do stuff with like the, with like the um, diverter valve and stuff like that and other upgrades. If you notice from a previous video, I don't have the catch can in the car right now. The reason I don't is I was trying to diagnose a problem with the car, as you saw in my previous videos, and I took it out as a means to figuring out what was causing the problems. Eventually, we found the problem, and it was the throttle body after a few other things here and there. So I may install the catch can again. I might not. More than likely, I'm probably going to put it back in when I go racing just so I can have it. But that's one of the big things. The other thing to look out for, the high pressure fuel pump. It has a tendency to go out as well. That's an easy fix if you know what to look for and can catch it in time. By easy fix, I mean take it to a shop, or if you're mechanically inclined, do it yourself. I'm not exactly sure on the cost of parts, but I hear the parts are not as expensive as you would think. So, there's that. I also had the water pump impeller replaced with a metal one, because the OEM one is plastic. Now, you don't have to do that. I went ahead and did that. I also had an upgraded timing chain put in the car with some better chain guides and everything and just made sure that that was not going to have many issues i also had the pistons replaced because despite the fact that it was a broken piston number three these are forged or these are cast pistons in this car and i decided to go ahead and put forged pistons in the car now i'm still running on the stock turbo along with a way motor works decatted downpipe but all in all, not bad. Those are the th mechanical things to look out for. Thankfully, in the second gens, you don't have the issues with the mushrooming strut towers that you had with the first gens. You might still have rust issues with these cars, but that's a given. Now, as far as performance goes, a standard Cooper S, 2008 or 2007 to 2010 Cooper S, has about 171 horsepower. Now, if you have the tuning kit on the car, like this one does, that bumps the horsepower up to about 191, which is not bad, actually. So we go from there. So this has a tuna kit on it. It also has the body, fit, body kit on it. Now, that's not necessarily something that needs to be part of the tuning kit upgrade, but this happened when the car was converted, so it has it. As far as that goes, that's pretty much it for a regular Cooper S. I mean, clutches might go out, so you might need to replace the clutch at some point drive shafts can wear out with these cars 
wheel bearings can wear out with these cars. And the list goes on and on. And a lot of the stuff can be fixed if you do preventative maintenance. So that's it with the 2008 Mini Cooper S over here. Let's turn our attention to this 2009 John Cooper Works Clubman. Now, in 2008, prior to 2009, the only way you could get a John Cooper Works was a dealer installed kit. That was the only way to do it. It had the tuning kit and it had the body kit. And the result was you had a Mini Cooper S John Cooper Works. Fast forward to 2009, Mini has decided to make John Cooper Works a brand or a model within the Mini lineup. And this was one of the results. This was a year after the launch of the R55 Clubman. And this is what they created. Now, you might notice it has a John Cooper Works bumper on the front, but if you walk around the sides, it has the standard black side skirts and the standard Cooper S rear bumper for that time period. The reason why is because the body kit was not a standard piece of equipment for the John Cooper Works at the time. So this owner or the previous owner added this bumper onto the car. Same scenario with my car here, the body kit was added. But that was the way they that was the way they did it. It was just it was a standard Cooper S front bumper with the John Cooper Works badging. Now you could later get the body kit as an upgrade on the car, or even something called an aero kit, which had a completely different look to it entirely. But this owner has the bumper on the front. This is the pre-LCI John Cooper Works bumper, much like mine, in that the pre-LCI is a one-piece bumper here while the post LCI, which LCI stands for life cycle impulse for those of you who don't know, but the post LCI is a two piece bumper here with a removable trim panel right here in the middle. Also like my race car over there, the brake ducts are in the grill, whereas they weren't standard kit in the pre LCI models. This one's nicely specced out though with carbon fiber hood scoop and carbon fiber mirror caps. The owner also searched high and low to get one with the lounge leather interior, which is very nice. Now, some mechanical differences between these two cars, as I shall show you, is, well, aside from the brakes, these are the John Cooper Works big brakes here, the sport brakes, as you can see with the red calipers. The Cooper S has the standard Cooper S brakes. But under the hood is where things changed because now that it was a factory model, you had, you still had the N14 motor, but it now had about 208 horsepower right out of the box from the factory. That's what it had under the, under the hood. 208 horsepower coming out of the N14 motor. This motor stayed in the John Cooper works from 2009 when it became a model all the way up to 2012. 2013, they finally switched over to the N18 motor and that was for the hardtop for its last year as a, as a model before it was replaced. And then 2014 for the Clubman and then 2015 for the Roadster and the Coupe respectively. So this is not a bad motor. Now the owner has replaced a lot of stuff in here, has done some upgrades. A lot of it is preventative maintenance. He'd rather not wait until the part wears out. He chose to replace it before the part wore out. So not bad. He also added a heat shield here. I do recommend one of those if you have the desire to do that. The turbo gets very hot in these cars. Consequently, that's also partly why they burn a lot of oil. The turbo in the N8 in the N14 John Cooper works though is much bigger than the turbo that's in the N14 motor in the Cooper S. This is a Cooper S turbo. That one has a John Cooper Works turbo. The turbos are slightly bigger. So, more horsepower, but otherwise it's the same motor. Now, he's also taken really good care of this car, cleaned it up, making it look nice and shiny. My engine over there looks like a mess. But another thing you can tell that makes this a John Cooper Works for N14 motor from the factory model is aside from it being an M14, there's no mini badging on it. There's no John Cooper works badging, nothing. You go over to the tuning kit car and it has not only the mini logo on the valve cover, it has the tuning kit logo right here and it has John Cooper works on the air box. Now this one had a different air box, I believe. I don't know if it had the cone air filter in it like mine does, but this is what an engine bay of a 
John Cooper Works factory model looked like from 2009 to 2012. Now, here's another distinguishing feature of the John Cooper Works factory models and the tuning kit ones at the time. Whether you had a tuning kit model or you had a factory one, you'll notice that the grill surround is black. That was a common feature on the John Cooper Works and the tuning kit models. So if you had a Cooper S with a chrome grill and you converted it to a JCW, it got a black grill. So that was a normal thing. It would still have the black trim rings or it would still have the chrome trim rings around the headlights. You can change those later like I did on mine, but this is basically how a John Cooper Works looked from the factory. It also has a different valance here, if you might notice. This one sticks out not quite as far as mine does. And that's because the guy who built the car for me replaced it. This is a later valance for the JCW body kit. And I think it's more of a aero one or a racing one or something along those lines. But otherwise it's the same car. Another thing you can usually tell with the JCW versus the Cooper S is this grill is the JCW grill. If it were the Cooper S grill, it would look probably a little bit different. And other than that though, the wheels would probably be these, which are the challenge spoke wheels. Now I have these on my 2014 John Cooper Works Clubman. And at one point I was considering those for that car, ended up not doing it. This one also has comfort access. That one's bone stock. This one also has pretty much every option imaginable in here, including navigation. Pretty snazzy panorama sunroof. The race car doesn't. Now here's where another interesting mechanical feat gets, gets noticed. 2008 was the last year for the mechanical limited slip differential, which this car has. 2009, all John Cooper Works models got the electronic locking differential control and the dynamic traction control meaning that they no longer had a mechanical limited slip differential in the car, but an electronic one. Now, it's not quite as fun as the mechanical one, but you can also upgrade it at some point to a mechanical one if you so chose. Many just decided to do this because their parent company, BMW, had the same system in the majority of their cars, and John Cooper Works being the high-end model, they wanted to have the same thing in those cars. So that's exactly what they did. Aside from all those things, these cars are mechanically about the same. This has 208 horsepower, like I stated. This one would normally have 191, but with all the modifications that's been done to it, it has probably closer to 240. But under normal circumstances with a stock Mini Cooper S, you'd have either 171 or with the John Cooper Works tuning kit in it, about 191, 196, give or take. Now, the later models, the N18 engines, the LCI cars, had 191, no, they had 181 for the Cooper S. And if you did the tuning kit, it gave you 208. So it would give you the same horsepower as the John Cooper Works. The John Cooper Works came from the factory with 208 horsepower, regardless of engine. So that's the difference. Here's another difference, though. The John Cooper Works has a different tuning curve, different RPM range, different power curve, power band than the Cooper S. The Cooper S has very low end torque at about second gear. The turbo kicks in, the overboost kicks in, and the car will launch down the road. So it's very rapid, but once it gets to the top end, it, it peters off and is a little on the slower side. The John Cooper Works may start off a little slow, but once it gets up to its top speed, it can keep going and its overboost kicks in at about third gear, give or take. So different cars, different specs, different ways of the way the cars do things, but equally just as fun, just as fast to drive. As far as cosmetic things to look for, if you're buying one of these, look for rust naturally with any car, look for repairs, Look for dents, because I have a few dents on this car, so look for those. I had a cracked windshield, which I replaced on this one. But otherwise, they're pretty much good vehicles if you know what to look for. Always, though, with every car, it doesn't matter how good the car looks 
always get the maintenance records if you can and make sure it's been thoroughly maintained and it's been well maintained because people do abuse these cars because they are the top of the line cooper s john cooper works they're the turbocharged ones and they have problems sometimes so just take care of them make sure they get the proper maintenance and if you're going to buy a used one make sure it's had the proper maintenance and if it hasn't had the proper maintenance you might be able to negotiate the price down low enough so you can fix it yourself or just avoid the car entirely if you're not comfortable doing that. Otherwise, they're not horrible engines, they're not horrible cars, and if you know what to look for, you're not gonna be scared about owning one. So some of you might be asking, how do you tell the difference between a factory John Cooper Works and one that's had the tuning kit installed? Or for that matter, a Cooper S that just has the JCW body kit? Well. I have both cars here so I can explain that. The John Cooper Works will have John Cooper Works badging, different side scuttles, specifically these usually. And if you go to the back of the car, it will say John Cooper Works on the back, but it will not say Cooper S on the back. If it says Cooper S, it's not a true John Cooper Works, doesn't matter what body kit is on the car, even if it is a JCW body kit. Now we go to my car here. This is a Cooper S with a John Cooper Works tuning kit. Now, how you can tell the difference? It may still look like a John Cooper Works. It still has the John Cooper Works badging. But if you go to the rear end of the car, you'll see Cooper S on the passenger side, and you'll see the John Cooper Works badge on the driver's side. Also, if you didn't notice, the John Cooper Works badge is different on the tuning kit ones versus the factory one different style of badge so that's another way of being able to tell these two apart so otherwise the other only other things to talk about that you might notice is the engine will be a little bit different the tuning kit will usually have john cooper works on it on the air box and it will usually have a tuning kit number on this one in this case r56s02797 so if you go to the engine in that car, it did not have a plate indicating what it was. For that matter, it didn't have any badging on the engine whatsoever to indicate what it was. But there's ways to figure it out. Now, if you don't have any of this badging at all, if there's no badging on the car, then you have to get crafty and you have to go to the VIN number. So if you take the VIN number and you type it in online or you contact your dealership and have them run the VIN number, they'll be able to tell you what this car was when it left the factory. Also, some factory John Cooper Works models had the big brakes, some did not. That was just a matter of how they were put together, but typically the factory JCWs have the bigger brakes on them, and they usually will have the challenge spoke wheels. These are called R112s. Anyway, it's hotter than heck out here. I hope you enjoyed this little video. If you did, leave a like below. Don't forget to comment. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel as I upload videos every Monday and Friday at 2 p.m. So until next time, I'm just going to remind you all that life is too short to drive a boring car. So as always, drive a mini. I'll catch you all later.